so I met you right before I got laid off. Then I got laid off and then I started a business and you started a business. Then we went to Thai Star and across Georgia, had a lunch and started talking about our visions and our plans. And one thing led to another and we both have our own booming empires now. So it's been great to see your growth from a distance. Yeah, likewise, man. Steven and I were both what you would call shit canned. Basically, we got canned. We were doing a job. We didn't get to do that job anymore. I was actually a partner in a prior business that it was time for me to go. They were like, bye, get out of here. I meet Pope a few months later and he's, you, you were running a successful PL for a large brand. I was more canned. But yeah, either way, we both found ourselves. <laughs> I grew them from 200K a month when I joined, almost a million dollars per month yeah, over the course of 18 months. Their business model got a little shaky. They got a little scared of some changes in the Amazon space and said, hey, Steven, here's a three-month severance. Uh, see ya. And I'm like, gosh dang it, 30-year-old dude making 200K. Who's going to hire me? And there was a 40-hour time period where I was like, did I peak? Did I peak at 30? And I was like, oh, shit. That is a really harsh thought to yeah. think at 30 yeah. years old. And I was like, damn it. No, I didn't peak. I'm just getting started. I'll hire myself. Yeah. And that's what I did. And it still took a long time to burn my ships to like go in on the agency thing. But I had dipped my toes in like consulting for five years and side hustled that. And so I knew what I was getting into. And I was like, oh, man, this is going to be ugly. This is going to be so much work. It's not hashtag passive income, which is what I signed up for when I tried to sell on Amazon. It worked out. Yeah, listen, I saw that YouTube ad also that was like passive free income. And I don't know, man, I didn't find it as well. This just seems to be work on the stream. But, you know, Stephen, your business has evolved quite a bit. Uh, it is kind of, it's been always gratifying to kind of follow your journey. I mean, you're just leading this monster agency, my Amazon guy. You guys are still focused on helping Amazon brands grow. Is that correct? Yes. We manage sure. about a billion dollars of Amazon sales uh, with 400 brands. That's amazing. I have to think about that in aggregate as well. Like we're probably in the 200 million in sales. So you think about that, like impact that Steven's team is having is about quadruple. When you think big picture about the art and science of selling on Amazon, building a successful company, like where do you see the most change and what are you guys doing about it? So it's getting harder. Amazon yeah. is entering the maturity phase. And so they're putting up more rules. They're making it harder for sellers to enter into the space. They're making it harder on the current sellers in the space. They push people out of Vendor Central. Seller Central is now where it's at. We're getting a lot of new tools in Seller Central. PPC costs are up. Some might see a 100% up cost, you know, in the, over the last six years, give or take. The sophistication that we saw the aggregators that we thought that they would bring to the table but failed at and went bankrupt, which Tyler and I were arguably one of the first on the internet to call that, by the way. There's video clips on YouTube where me and Tyler, before anybody even knew what an aggregator was, we were saying, what the heck is this? They're going to fail. Here's why. <laughs> I have a strong opinion on this one. What, what's yours? Well, I'm going to give you mine and I can't, I can't wait to hear yours. So here I'm giving this opinion as a guy who is, I think I've talked to 12 of these aggregator funds in the last six months. So in other words, this is kind of coming from the CFO, what drives enterprise value if I'm trying to exit down the line. And I think what's most important is to have a coherent strategy. And I, I know I keep like saying that same thing, but having 75 totally different products is not as valuable on the market as having 10 really, really well put together products that are moving. I'd love to hear your thoughts here. Like, what are you coaching your clients on this? I, I think it's always better to op open up a new complimentary product because I've seen so many brands that launch colors two through 10 yeah. and their, their, their top line on that parentage is static. Mm -hmm. But if they had launched product two or three complimentary products, their top line skyrocketed. And so, you know, we might have been profits. That doesn't mean we profited from it. <laughs> like no way to hedge, no way to like bet against the house on that one that I was aware of. We saw it coming. We knew what was going to happen. They failed because they didn't have tenacity and grit. They freaking stocked yeah. out of their best sellers, all that stuff. So people know about that. I know people are tired of hearing about ag. So that'll be my last comment on that. But what I will say is I structurally think the choice that I made as an agency to stick to the basics has really paid off for me. A lot of tech firms or softwares come and go because they marry themselves to a two-step URL and it gets Banned, or they marry themselves to incentivize reviews and that gets banned. Or they say, hey, put product inserts where you ask for a review and give them a gift and that gets banned. And then everybody has to send their inventory up. The drop shipping guys that get banned, the passive income guys that end up in court, all of these get rich quick models have failed. And MAG has always preached basics. We've always shared our trade secrets. And so as an agency, that position has been defensible. So I've been really grateful to see that work out for me. When I say basics, here's the things 
that I mean. Anything okay. that grows traffic in the form of PPC, SEO, CTR, click-through rate, and then second, the conversion improvements that come from design, merchandising, and troubleshooting. So those two components are the growth one-two punches. I just started doing some Muay Thai boxing and jujitsu, and I got to tell you, one-two is like ingrained into my head. So one, okay. traffic, two, conversion, just over and over and over again. And I can win a fight just using those one-two punches. I don't need my three hook. I don't need my upper, right. upper cuts. Those basics are enough. We've also seen that Amazon, who had former enemies in Shopify and Facebook, become friendly because the enemy of my enemy is now my friend. And their enemy right. is Timu. Their enemy is TikTok and basically these Chinese conglomerates. I think Amazon's a monopoly. I, I think it's beneficial to the consumer in most regards. A monopoly that does good things for society is generally still good, but there are many things that a monopoly inevitably does that causes its own destruction. They take advantage of people. And in this case, it's sellers. And so right. sellers, I have more churn on sellers giving up on Amazon or running out of money than I have anything else. If you look at the books of sellers all the time, we've had mutual clients in the past who are no longer in business today. We look back three, four years ago, we had a mutual client. They raised money two, maybe even three times, and they no longer own their company. They're out of business. We're seeing the financial pressures are higher now today. Amazon's still worth doing. I want to make that quick jest. There's a lot of reasons for that, but I also like to speak to the truths, the challenges, and the problems. And realistically, a 15% net net margin, still doable on Amazon today and still respectable in almost any industry. I have what I call the main image hack. The only reason I label it that way is to get people to pay attention. But in reality, it's not a hack. It's an optimization, right? As a quick example, when we look at a main image for a product, let's say, you know, one of my favorite examples, and I, I could do some show and tell on this if you're interested, is a Happy Me journal. And when we took that business on, it was for a friend of mine. I did it for free. And I said, hey, Nas, let me just fix your main image. And he's like, okay. whatever. It's not going to make a difference. Nobody's going to care. We did that. All of a sudden, it tripled his sales. And I was just like, whoa, that's really cool. He didn't even have A-plus content up. He didn't have a lot of the other things that are super important to succeed. So I'll briefly pull this on screen here with your permission. So here is on the left, the before. And when I ask people, why would you buy this product? Typical answer I get is because it's yellow. Now, when I ask you though, Tyler, why would you buy the product on the right? Spout out first things that hit your head. Yeah, I mean, it's very age specific. I like the cute artwork. I know what's in there. I think when I look at the left-hand side, I'm kind of not 100% sure what I'm buying. I know what I'm buying there. So, yeah, this is very cool. Not only do we have the age, so we know it's for six to 12 year olds. We know that the kids continuation journal keyword is on there. And the artwork is usually the thing that people notice last. I like that you said it first because it's not just a blank journal. It's a fun journal with images to entice your young son to write in their journal. This is not a hack, but I call it the main image CTR hack because when I labeled it and when I branded it that, it took off. I am definitely known for being the CTR guy. And the reason for that is because I don't think I have a lot of unique perspective on PPC to offer. I think that the industry has set some standards that I fairly adopt and agree with. Mm -hmm. I might say something like, hey, I don't think PPC automation is where it's at today. I think you should do it manual. We took an account over just this past 10 days where a top five PPC software, which I will not name, which is expensive. We took that account over and grew that account by 163% in seven days at the same A cost by taking over an account. And by the way, this wasn't a small account. They made 63K the week before we met. We grew them to $190,000 or something like that the following week just on PPC at the same ACOS. I have very strong opinions about PPC techniques and strong opinions about all kinds of things. But the reason why I talk incessantly about CTR and click-through rate is because everybody's getting that one wrong. Next year, after I've convinced the market and the market has now adopted it, now if you go on LinkedIn today, you'll see like four different people talking about CTR and they're using my same message. One really powerful influencer took my exact post, ran it through AI and said, rewrite this. It was my exact messaging, just rewrote it and posted it. And I was like, come on, man, come on. You're the CTR guy. This has a massive impact. Maybe this is a great time to ask the classic, like what are people getting wrong related to CTR? Give sure. us some kind of like paint that dichotomy for me a little bit so that people can actually improve in this area of the business. So just like that yellow journal image we looked at, they're not showing a keyword. They're not giving us a description of what the product is. They don't tell us who it's for. They don't give us any context. And in this day and age, when PPC costs are so high and Amazon is charging you to get even on page one, essentially, you have to demand that click or you're not going to get a sale. And so when I talk about my ICAP marketing funnel, 
impressions, clicks, add to carts, and purchases. And I was first out to talk about the new brand analytics in Search Query Performance Report a couple of years ago. I immediately was like, man, this is the best data Amazon's ever given us. And so we were able to really articulate and go in, into the weeds to see like how powerful this is. We can now see down to the keyword level what my impression share is, what my click through share is. When I identified that, I was like, oh my goodness, there's such an opportunity here because now I can take the data that Amazon is giving me at my own keyword level. I could then put one of those keywords onto my main image and measure the impact. And we were seeing click through rates double on some keywords and triple on some other ones. For example, the Happy Me Journal, we tripled his traffic in seven days by just changing the main image. That tripling of traffic tripled his sales in seven days. Okay, so a lot of times people think, oh, when you mess with the main image, you hurt the conversion rate. And that is completely false. And in fact, in most instances, it goes up. We're seeing click through rate is the most important thing to focus on in 2024 on Amazon because it's the freaking easiest. It's the watermelon lowest hanging fruit. And it has a massive impact, low effort, high return. That's what finance guys talk about all day long. Yeah. When you name a podcast return on podcast, you love stuff like that, right? The ROI kind of mantra. So, and this is for me as like more of a finance guy, less ops, less Amazon savvy. You've described a couple of things that seem like they're very specifically related to the main image. When you say improving your CTR, is it kind of all about that main image or are there other yes. tactics? It really is all about the main image because the only other things that affect click through rate are harder to do or harder to swallow. So the harder to do, if you get a bestseller badge, obviously your click through rate is going to go up. Uh, Amazon's choice, maybe. Your review count, you can't control that. So why talk about it? You just need orders to get reviews. There's no review generation strategies that work in 2024. We look at back in the day when Seller Labs first came out with email automation. Heck yeah. Back then, review gen was all about the blaze. But today, mm -hmm. not so much. Everybody's opted out. You can't even email your customers. Just none of those programs work. When we look at structurally speaking, like where should you focus and spend your time? You could spend one to 10 hours on your main image and double your sales. Name another tactic on Amazon where that is true. And then the last right. thing that's in your control, but harder to swallow is price. If you lower your price 50%, I guarantee you, your click through rate will double, but that doesn't necessarily come out as sustainable. Now, should you do it on occasion to get a boosting rate? Absolutely. And I have a lot of pricing strategies that I advocate for. I believe in dynamic pricing. You probably had Chad Rubin on the podcast where he has a whole business model on dynamic pricing. When you keep things static, it's worse on Amazon. Wouldn't want to keep your price static. You wouldn't want to keep your PPC campaign static. You need to go in and optimize. You wouldn't set up a $10,000 PPC campaign and then not go back and optimize it. The same yep. can be said about SEO. It's not set and forget it. I've launched four phases of SEO been public with my plan. It's all about indexing, then ranking, then market share. And we have mm. all of these structured plays that we run. So in my brand manager playbook, we have 75 different plays. We give it to the brand manager to use an NFL or a football metaphor. Our brand managers are like the quarterback. I'm the general manager. The directors are like the coaches. So we build these plays. We give it to the quarterback and say, run these plays. We don't know which play is going to work on the field at any given time. We have a general right. sense or a general idea. If you need to call a timeout to talk to the coach, Mr. Quarterback, go ahead. But we trust you. Then on the quarterback, he's got a project manager. He's got a lineman to protect him with defense. We've got specialists and troubleshooters, a designer and a PPC guy and, and anything else that's required to sell on Amazon. And so that's like the structured team that's required to do well on Amazon today. And this Excellent. is why the agency model is solvent because Amazon doesn't care about the seller. So somebody has to. So you pay me to care about you as a seller. And then I bring a team aspect. We go win the, the Super Bowl for it. One of the things that I think naturally born leaders do is they take complicated subject matter and they simplify it down. And the people yeah. that are really good at that tend to be the smartest people, the best leaders, the most successful in business. I look at a lot of strategies every day, all day long. I look at strategies. And what I always come back to time and time again is the KISS model. Keep it simple, stupid. And so that's why I structurally boil everything down to traffic and conversion. I look at a model like Chad's. I love Chad as a person, but I think his model is too complicated, right? If I asked you to tell me in one sentence, what does Chad do? What would you say? And I think prophecy uses a ton of complex data to help you do micro A-B testing. I get your point. The point is, is you're doing very complicated pricing A-B testing, basically. And I would simplify that down one layer further and say it's all about dynamic pricing. So the question right. then becomes how often 
often should I change my price? If somebody today listening to this has never changed their price, their takeaway message should be change your price up or down once every one to three months. And that would improve your sales. And yep. Chad would agree with that. And so would most Amazon experts. Question then becomes, well, cool. Where is my diminishing return? Should I change my price every day? Should I change it every hour? And so the complexity of the model then starts to layer in, then you need technology. But for most Amazon sellers, this is overwhelming. Like how many tech tools right. do you have in your stack? How many actions should I take as a seller on a daily basis? And the answer is generally you have a thousand things that you can do. There's only two or three that you really should do. So now that we've established that and whether you agree with that or not, but I'm establishing that. Cool. Now, Stephen Pope, what are the two or three things that I should always focus on? And the answer okay. to that is traffic and conversion. And CTR specifically is the easiest way to affect both of those. But mostly it's a traffic metric, but it still right. helps conversion because the people who have a six-year-old that click on that Happy Me journal are eight times more likely to buy that once they click it. We know on Amazon that you need sales to get sales. We know that if you get a PPC sale, that you'll get three organic sales over six months from that PPC sale on average. All of the things that you do to get additional sales are incremental. This is not true on a website. On a website, if you spend $100 on Google ads, you'll get X dollars in return, hopefully $400 in return. Doesn't always work like that. But let's mm -hmm. say you get a four to one ROAS. The second you turn off Google ads, though, it's down to zero. Right. On Amazon, the reverse is true. When you spend $100 on Amazon PPC, and you get your $400 back, hopefully with 25% ACoS or four to one ROAS, which is really incredible in most categories, by the way, but let's say that's yeah. true. And then you turn off PPC, what happens, you still get $50 in sales, you still get $100 in sales. And the reason for that is because the algorithm rewards conversion, the algorithm mm. rewards clicks. And the best part about this is that your ACoS goes down when your conversion goes up, your ACoS goes down when your CTR goes up, because Amazon rewards that engagement. This is not right. true about any other marketplace, any other platform in the world, to my knowledge, at this time, that's what's special about Amazon. This is why 80% of the brands that I work with are native born Amazon brands, they only mm. sell on Amazon, they launched on Amazon, they don't have any interest in doing anything else. I obviously want to go upstream and work with mid market brands that have an omni channel approach. But I sure. like to appreciate that what Amazon has done or what it is. And once you understand or appreciate that you can work within those confines, because you'll That's never right. have anybody come on your podcast, Tyler and say, Hey, I was born on Walmart, that'll never happen. Why? Never. Because Walmart's not a marketplace. Walmart is a retail store that happens to have a website, and then they <laughs> push their retail store product in the algorithm to the top. And then some cursory secondary products show up at the bottom of results. So you'll never be able to born child you'll never be able to bear a new brand on Walmart. So that's what I like about Amazon. That's why I think the basics matter. And I think simplifying yeah. the model down the traffic and conversion is the way to go. And we can debate about what's the best traffic method or what's the best conversion method and which tool does this or does that. And a lot of people like data and I'm, I'm a big fan of data. But the longer I've been doing this, the less data I look at unless it's the brand analytics and the ICAP report, I freaking love that stuff. But like right. secondary right. tools and, and methodologies, I've used less and less the more I've done this. The bad news is, is everybody is wasting money on a PPC. <laughs> right. The problem is, and this is a marketing conundrum that has potentially always existed in marketing, is, it, is that half your budget is being wasted. The problem is you just don't know which half. And you don't know which half is the bad half. In Amazon PPC, it's not that bad. There are things that you can go in and do. Here's an action item. This can reach the barrier of two or three things that you do today if you're a seller okay. listening to this. And that is, if you haven't added negations to your auto and broad match campaigns in the last seven days, you are throwing money out the door. Broad and auto campaigns are the lowest a cost campaigns when managed properly, mm -hmm. full stop. So a lot of people over index on exact match, they overpay. Now, if everybody's paying for the same bid, the same keyword, what happens? Bids go up. So if you right. spend money on broad and auto, which is under indexed, you're going to have a lower a cost. Now the challenge here, the trade off is you need to go in and add negations. So if you're a lazy PPC manager, and you don't want to go in and manage stuff, just set up exact campaigns and piss your money and walk away. But if you're <laughs> an optimizer, and you spend four hours a week touching your campaigns minimum, then go in and add broad and auto campaigns and add 
negations over time. There's keyword discovery. Never negate a good keyword is one of the mantras that I have. So don't like promote it from broad over to exact. Leave it alone in broad match campaigns. I know we're going super deep on this particular articulation, but my point is, is that there are many things that you can do to limit wasted ad spend on PPC that doesn't require an all or nothing methodology. And I think all or nothing methodologies are scary because right. they're so damaging if something goes wrong. And so it's better to use three to 5% optimization techniques on a daily basis. It's safer. It's going to have less trade-off and you can still get to the same end result. It just takes two weeks. If you have a product that's churning a thousand units, you should buy 12,000 units. If you have a product churning five units, I might only buy one or 200 units on that one. What happens is, is that somebody gets really excited. Oh, I'm launching the new color. My original color was black and I'm launching the red. I'm going to buy the same number of red as I did black. And then what happens? They sell 10% of the red of what the black sold. And then that's where it becomes dead inventory. I'm not a fan of color variation expansion. I think the KISS model solves this as well. Ford said it best when he said you can have any color you like as long as it's black. And instead of launching another color variation, you need to launch a full brand new accessory, full new brand product or extension because you're not going to grow your brand by launching a color variation. I would be hard pressed to hear a single story where somebody comes on and says, I doubled my brand because I added a color variation. That is not a 10x activity. I'm currently reading 10x as a book. Highly recommend it. It's definitely going to put it on my top 10 books of the year in 2024. My full list of books, if you're curious, of every year, my Amazon guy.com slash books. I find myself frequently reading one or two audibles a week as I go hike in the forest and do my thing to try and stay physically fit. But I'm in the best shape of my life. I started doing jujitsu. I've got Muay Thai boxing. Couldn't be happier. And father of five, I like to think everything in my life can be prosperous, not just wealth. I think health, family, spirit, emotion, all of that can all be prosperous. And if you're an entrepreneur listening to this, I think you should do the same thing. I think that if you're just trying to go for growth at the cost of any of the other buckets, then what's the point? You're just going to be trading one bucket for another. If you focus on all of them as a concept, you'll make way better decisions. 